Hello and uh, welcome back. Today we will start with module 6 uh, which primarily will deal with bilingual language processing. This uh, module will tell us about uh, the various ways language processing uh, is understood, how they are uh, investigated and what do we get out of it, what, what kind of result do we get and how to interpret that uh, output. So, before we get into that because this is a completely experimental um, chapter, we will talk about uh, all the different types of experiments that are done in order to, uh, within this uh, domain. So, before that let us get the basic idea about this um, uh, area. So, we will have some um, grounding work done first before we move on to the bilingual language processing in all its uh, different shades. So, to start with today we will discuss about um, what is processing? What do we, we keep using the word bilingual language processing or language processing in general, what do we mean by that? So, we will need to first understand that aspect before we move on to the uh, more complicated parts. So, what is processing? How is it measured? What are the designs? How are the output uh, calculated and so on? So, these things we will discuss first and then the second part within today's lecture, we will also try to cover. Uh, how the bilingual language processing studies have evolved because anything that uh, we see today is the result of many years, in fact many decades of work uh, put in together by the scientists. So, what we understand today, if I just give you that much of information, it, you will not be able to uh, understand the, uh, the background of it. So, we will also discuss the background of the development of this particular uh, domain. Now, uh, when we talk about processing we are automatically taken to the domain of psycholinguistics. What is psycholinguistics? Uh, let me first give you a brief idea about what psycholinguistics is all about. Psycholinguistics is a subdiscipline, you can call it a discipline within linguistics, but it is also uh, slightly away from the, from the or typical linguistics domains because this deals with the psychology of language as in how mental processes and language are connected what are the different mental states, what are the different mental processes, how are one group of humans different from another group of humans in terms of certain language related uh, tasks and all these kinds of uh, fields are part of psycholinguistic research. So, in terms of language acquisition uh, using experimental method, language processing using experimental method, uh, trying to understand the background cognition in terms of uh, language processing all of these are part of psycholinguistic research. So, at the very base of it psycholinguistics concerns itself with language processing. What does processing mean? Processing is slightly different from uh, simply speaking or understanding. Processing takes us to the background mechanism. Okay. So, background by background mechanism we mean the computation. Now, if I just ask you one, uh, I will just give you a series of uh, words and ask you whether you understand those words or not. On the surface at a linguistic level, at, a, at the surface level, you might just say okay, this uh, one word, first word was understandable, second word was okay, third word did not sound uh, familiar and so on. So, this is the surface of it, the language part of it. But psycholinguistics tries to find out why is it so that you took, let us say you took longer to react to an, an object and uh, a stimulus that was actually not a word. So, what are the mechanisms that makes you take more time, less time? What are the mechanisms at the back of it? That is the domain of psycholinguistics. So, psycholinguistics takes us to the psychological aspect of language. That is why we call it a processing. It is not simply speaking or understanding because it also involves the men, different mental states and mental functions. Now, the tricky part here is that when you speak or you understand that bit is visible or audible as the case may be. But mental processes are largely invisible and also they are unconscious. The reason why let us uh, say that I give you a word like, uh, like this, this is a word in English uh, language. So, this refers to uh, the tiny rodent type of animal. Now, let us say you are a bilingual, bilingual in Hindi and English, right. Now, this is uh, this is a word in English, but this is not a word in, uh, in Hindi. 
I give you another word like this. The question is, is this a word? To me, it looks like a non-word. But let's say if this comes directly after this, so mole followed by a word like tol. Now, if that is the case, and you are a Hindi speaker, you will automatically, immediately, because tol mole is a word in Hindi. But if your task is to say whether it is a word in English or not, here you will take a little bit of more time. Because even if it is not a proper word in English language, but you are still going back to your Hindi and that, that interference will take make you take longer to react. This aspect of processing is what we are interested in. So, what we see is this is yes and this is a no, this will uh, get a yes response, this will get a no response, but the no response will take a little bit longer even though it is simply not a word in English. So, this is the aspect, this is the uh, phase in language processing that psycholinguistics looks at, right. So, what happens on the surface and why it happens? So, how do you connect both the deeper aspect of it and the surface structure? So, that is where psycholinguistics comes in. Now, this bit is unconscious because you are not really, the subjects do not really sit down and think that, okay, this sounds like a Hindi word, let me uh, you know, understand and nothing like that. This is not a conscious process at all. We do not really think and decide. This is simply because it is there that uh, Hindi word is somewhere there in your mental lexicon. So, it takes care of that aspect. Hence, it is unconscious. Now, the questions that uh, there are many uh, specific questions. This is the general level of what processing is uh, P is all about, but in a specific level, we need to have a proper question, research question. What exactly is it that we are looking at? Because as I said, this particular small problem, very simplistic problem in psycholinguistics uh, research can be actually looked at from different perspectives. So, one could be is what is the mental representation of both the languages. We have talked about memory in, um, in terms of bilingual language, a lexical memory. So, what is it? So, this basically takes us to the shared memory hypothesis if we recollect, right. So, there are this kind of different questions that could be asked. So, how does the mental representation of these processes look like? So, for this example that I have just given you, what is the background mechanism? What is the mental representation? So, to put it very simply, to put it in you know, the gist of it is what happens when we are busy doing language. Doing language means whether we are speaking or we are understanding. So, when we say processing, processing has two parts. Okay? So, processing is the overarching umbrella term for uh, that we use for to include both comprehension and production. So, basically this means both speaking and understanding. Okay. So, this is what processing is all about. So, how, what are, what are the different aspects, what are the different processes involved when we comprehend as well as what are the different uh, processes involved when we speak. These are the two things that come under the broader term language processing. So, with that uh, bit of a short intro, now let us move on to what are the methods that we apply, what are the methods the psycholinguistics applies. There are many, but we will be considering only online methods here. Online of course, does not mean uh, doing things in terms of the way we are understanding online these days, not in a remote sense, but online as in as the things happen in a dynamic way. So, right now as I am speaking, what are the mental processes that are taking place in my mind right now simultaneously? is what we mean by online uh, in this domain. So, online methods are very important because they help us, they take to the processing of language as it happens, as it unfolds. As you are trying to figure out um, a simple uh, word, non-word on the, on the screen, what is, what is happening in your mind then and there, that is what is online method. So, the process is of course, not accessible once the task is over, that is why it is very crucial. So, you cannot uh, make somebody see um, a display and then later on you sit down and analyze that data. This is where a very important difference is uh, difference uh, exists between psycholinguistics and other descriptive linguistic processes. In other linguistic uh, descriptive processes, you take down the language data, you get the word list, you get the sentences, you get various kinds of grammatical um, structures, stories, narrations, so on and so forth and later on we can uh, analyze them, we can annotate them and so on. But this is 
that is where the difference lies. In this case, we will uh, we typically make the participants take part in some kind of either comprehension or production task and it is judged then and there. The processing is um, investigated then and there, right. So, this means trying to understand the underlying mechanism as the participant is doing some tasks. So, there, there are various kinds of tasks which we will see now. These tasks are designed in a way so as to help us understand the effect of one variable, sometimes one variable, sometimes a combination of variables, sometimes you also want to see how one variable interacts with another. So, what do we mean by variable? Variable is a, a thing that changes and as a result of which the result also changes. So, for example, I can ask a bilingual versus a monolingual to do the same task that I mentioned just before. So, if we have a um, mole versus uh, the same, let me let me give you the same example. This is uh, this is the task, and now I can have a monolingual subject, uh, monolingual as well as bilingual subjects. So, this is the variable. This is one of the variables. Okay. So, how many languages does the participant know? Is one variable. Variable as in a condition that varies across participants and as a function of which the result also will vary. So, these are variables. So, whether you are a participant is a monolingual versus a bilingual. So, if it is a monolingual English speaker, the time gap, time lapse that we saw will not happen. But if it is a bilingual Hindi English bilingual, we can expect a time lapse in case of toll. That is the idea. So, this is how the designs are created. So, we already have a fixed, uh, there are tasks that are that are that exist. But the task is designed in such a way that will take us to the research question and to understand them better. So, for example, prime and the effect of masking, this, these are the things that we will discuss now. So, there are priming uh, tasks and then there are mask paradigm and so on. So, priming can be checked as one variable, but priming can also come along with masking. So, how, what is the interaction between these two and how are they jointly or individually? impact the results. So, this, these are various things that we need to take into account when we talk about experimental technique. So, uh, when we say processing, we will talk about processing at two levels, lexical processing and syntactic processing. Lexical processing means processing at the word level. What happens when we uh, deal with words at an individual level, single words, single individual words just like we saw here. These are all single words. So, this, this is, uh, this will come under what we call lexical processing. But when we talk about when we use a full sentence as or more than a full, more than one sentence as input as stimulus, that is what we will be calling syntactic processing. So, we will start with the lexical processing that is processing at the word level. When we talk about um, bilingual language processing at lexical level, there are n number of questions that have been asked, n number of research agenda that have been investigated and with various methods and tasks and so on. So, there are uh, a lot of a lot lot of questions that are that needed uh, to be answered. But uh, primarily uh, the major uh, major questions, the broader questions that we have been asking for many decades now are typically these two, right. So, are the two languages of a bilingual active simultaneously? How are the two systems? two systems as in one language, a language can be called a system because it has various layers and within each layer there are multiple uh, number of networks which we discussed in the uh, introductory lecture. So, this basically as a result of which each language is like an ants, ant hill, you know it has so many processes involved at so many level la layers and each layer having so many levels and so on. So, these are the primary questions that um, have been investigated in lexical processing within bilingualism. And for doing that, as we will shortly see that these two questions cannot be answered by simply having one task. Each question has been uh, you know, tried to be investigated using a number of tasks and then making different permutations and combinations of those tasks using different kinds of methods and so on. So, but basically at the, at the root of it, these are the two questions that we have trying to understand and we are still trying to understand, still trying to get there. And in terms of methods, there are primarily two kinds of method. One is the behavioral method and the other is non-behavioral method. What is a behavioral method? Behavioral methods are those methods that depend on 
some kind of behavioral output from the participant. So, the participant has to do something either he has to say something or he has to press a key to, to denote some answer yes no kind of an answer um, and so on. So, these are behavioral output which means the subject has to do something right. So, there is a stimulus given and the subject has to react to it in some way that is the behavior those are the behavioral methods. Within behavioral methods there are we will discuss only a few uh, here. So, memory measures and reaction time studies and so on. In terms of non-behavioral, uh, the significant difference between behavioral and non-behavioral tasks or methods is that in case of behavioral ta methods, the subject has to do something. In case of non-behavioral task, the subject does not uh, typically do anything as in there is no um, output in that sense. So, the person is let us say is just simply watching a display, some words, some pictures or something and the tools that are used capture the underlying mechanism from that uh, uh, typically from his brain. So, there are various kinds of imaging techniques and then um, uh, typically brain imaging, brain mapping techniques and eye tracking and so on. So, there is a display or there is some kind of a task the person is busy doing that and then there are tools that, that collect the information uh, from the uh, either from the eye movement or from the brain waves and you know how the oxygen level in the blood increases in the brain and so on. So, there are these are the two kinds of uh, methods. The brain mapping methods we have already talked uh, in the in the previous uh, one of the previous sections. So, we will not get in there uh, again. Today we will discuss more about behavioral methods. Now, in terms of behavioral methods there are uh, one of them is memory measures. There are various kinds of tasks that can be utilized to understand how the human memory interacts with different kinds of language functions and what are the variables. Remember variable is that thing which changes. So, a, um, a high proficient bilingual versus low proficient bilingual, monolingual versus bilingual, you know early learner versus late learner this can be these are some of the variables that can be utilized. So, depending on those variables there are certain kinds of tasks. Now, the rationale behind this kind of studies is that people's memory for certain expressions or it can be words or sentences whatever could indicate how that expression, how that word or the concept was represented in the brain, how it was mentally represented and, um, and, and how that representation is retrieved or accessed right. So, this is primarily the uh, fundamental rationale for this. So, typical memory measures will have um, this kind of tasks or designs will have two levels. First level is the memorizing stage and the second is the task stage. We have already seen some examples in the previous uh, segments, uh, but uh, we will just go over this in very brief. So, in the first stage remember if you remember there are many types of this, but one type has been to give a list of words to the participants to, uh, to, to read and to memorize and then there is a gap. Uh, there are various designs that we are what to do with respect to that gap. Sometimes there is simply a gap, sometimes there is a different completely different unrelated task that is uh, uh, incorporated in the middle and then comes the task stage or stage 2 or stage B whatever you call it where the person has to either recall, free recall. So, there are two kinds of um, things that can be done in the second stage. First stage is memorization learning and the test stage can have two kinds of output. So, one could be free recall free recall as in how many words uh, you can remember, how many of words you can freely remember. For example, this is a, a very simplistic example for a free recall test. So, let us say we have a, we have given this uh, stage 1 memorizing or learning stage. So, here the participant will be ok. So, the participant is given a list like this and this they, they have to memorize it and then there is a gap here is the gap where they let us say they play chess for some time and then comes the stage 2 where they have been they, they will be told to simply recall as many words as they can right from the uh, previously given list. This is a free recall as the name suggests this is there is no constraint uh, absolutely free. So, you simply remember try and recall as many words as you can. Now, here there can be many variables. So, you can uh, you know give uh, this can be a single word single language list it can be a mixed language list uh, depending on what you are trying to look at. This list could have 
if this is a monolingual list right so we can also make it a bilingual list by mixed i mean bilingual so it could be a let's say hindi english uh, bilingual list so bird and then house and then this and then in between we can have a few hindi words and then another hindi word here and so on so there are the man these are the manipulations that are possible there are many other possibilities as well but this is basically the primary task is this stage 1 will be learning stage 2 will be recalling simple now uh, depending on the research question this is uh, what we are trying to probe, we can make various changes in the uh, initial list learning stage. Another kind of uh, memory measure is uh, recognition. Recognition is uh, similar to the previous one. Again, we have a list of words and there could be a break where you can play, you know, you can play something or you can just simply have a gap or something. Uh, Let us just say there is a gap of, of um, some time, 10, 15 minutes or so and then there is a, there is stage 2. In the stage 2, however, this is there is slight difference. Now, we can give them a list and ask how many of these words or which uh, whether this word was be present before. So, this was presented as a list and this can be presented individually. So, one word at a time. So, you see baboon coming here, right? Because we had monkey here and baboon is coming here, even though they are not the same thing, it there will be a slight time, there is the possibility that there will be a slight time lapse here to say no, this is a no answer, right? This is a no uh, question. This is also a no. This is a yes. This is also yes. See, so how we can change, make changes. So, in this particular example, one of the variable could be if they are semantically connected, what will happen? So, we have a semantic connection between monkey and baboon. So, even if it did not uh, occur before, there will be some uh, amount of disturbance that we can expect. So, these are the different kinds of um, variables we can build in, but primary level de de design is like this. Then comes what we call reaction time methods. Reaction time methods have been um, very useful and it has been really productive for quite many decades now. And um, the reaction time is basically the time that you take to react. Now, this is uh, this is actually this is a very dependent variable. Dependent variable is which ultimately in the in an experimental paradigm, this is what is our data. So, if we change those independent variables like um, the, the way we choose our words, if they are semantically similar versus they are phonologically similar and some their translation equivalence of each other, if we are using it in a mixed language context, all of these can be which we have been which I have been calling variables, they are independent variables. Now, because of those independent variables, the reaction time may change. That is why reaction time is called a dependent variable. Whether the reaction time will change or not will depend on the those other variables that we have used, that we have incorporated in the design. That is why this is a dependent variable. So, basically this is the output. Finally, this is the output that we have as a data. And this is what uh, uh, we go by, this is what we analyze in the uh, when, we, when we say we are analyzing the data. So, the time basically is the after the onset of the stimuli. So, there is the stages of the um, display that comes in the picture, that comes in the screen. Uh, I will have some designs uh, put there, we will see them shortly. But uh, there is this the typically in a typical uh, experimental paradigm, there will be a blank screen in the beginning. Uh, on the, there is a computer screen that is there that is which is blank and there will be a uh, we call it fixation, um, fixation cross in the middle and the participants are supposed to look at it and that is how it is calibrated. And then let us say we have this um, recall task. So, there is this list of uh, sorry, there is a lexical decision task. So, there is a word here and then that is a bit of uh, blank and then there is a target word here. So, this target word when target word comes so let us say this is on the screen for 300 milliseconds. We uh, all measurements in the reaction time studies are done in milliseconds, uh, 3000 milliseconds. So, th this is that onset of the stimulus for us. We are trying to see a prime, this is a prime target uh, kind of a design. So, th this is what the, uh, this is what needs a reaction, okay. This one does not need a reaction, this one needs a reaction now. So, the moment the stimulus has come on the screen from that moment till the reaction 
from the participant gets logged into the system is the reaction time. So, onset of the stimuli to the onset of the reaction is what we call reaction time, right. So, this is the result that is calculated as a function of the type of stimulus. So, depending on what kind of stimulus you have given and how that results into difference in timing is what our data is. And the baseline, the basic premise of this entire uh, design is the longer you uh, take, the more difficult the task must have been, which is almost common sense. So, if we, uh, if, if you are given a difficult task, you will take more time to do it. If you are given a simple task, you take less time to do it. So, the reverse, tech, reverse uh, idea is used here. So, if you are taking longer to process a word, to understand a word or to you know uh, speak out um, uh, in production studies. So, whatever the, the time duration, the gap, the difference between time duration as a function of the stimulus is um, equivalent to the processing difficulty. Simply put, higher the reaction time, the more difficult the task has been, lower the reaction time, the more easy it has been. Right? So, this at, at a fundamental level, this is a very simplistic uh, design. Now, there are various kinds of um, uh, designs that can that are used um, with reaction time as the output. Okay, so, reaction time is simply the output. Now, you can make the participants do, uh, participate in different kinds of tasks, all of which will ultimately give us a time uh, in terms of milliseconds. So, reaction time is always millisecond. Okay, this is something that you need to keep in mind. So, there are different kinds of designs like lexical decision. Uh, priming paradigm, translation recognition, self paced reading and so on. There are many kinds, we will discuss only a few. All of these I am discussing beforehand because um, as we go ahead, as we talk about processing literature, we will be talking primarily about experimental uh, evidence. Uh, what kind of processing strategies have been found that bilinguals are typically uh, found to use uh, and how those strategies change with respect to different kinds of factors. So, before we get into that complexity, we need to understand these various designs one by one. So, we will go um, in, a, in a methodical way. So, we will first look at the comprehension tasks and then we will go to production tasks. As we said that both comprehension and production are part of the larger uh, domain of uh, what we call processing. right? So, what is a comprehension task? As the name suggests, a comprehension task is simply where the participants need to understand the given stimulus, understand or comprehend that is why comprehension task. So, there is a stimulus on the screen and the participant needs to understand right. And now, um, there are many ways to check whether the person has understood or not, often there is an yes no option, there, there, is, there is a question is this a word, is this not a word, so yes no output right. So, the participants needs to answer, typically the answer is given by pressing a key. Those keys in the keyboard are always customized. So, one uh, person may use um, for yes, no, right or left key, Some per another person may use the Y and N key. It is customized depending on the each experimenter ha can have different kinds of customized keys for response, but typically it will be a key press. So, the, there is a display, the person has to look at the display, task is to understand and then press a key to react. And that time between the task and the reaction is our reaction time in millisecond, right. So, for example, um, after showing a word on the screen, the participant can be asked like, is this a word like we have just talked about. Now, let us see there are words like this, okay, is this meaningful, is it a possible structure and many kinds of questions you can ask. A, a simple example would be, let us say we have a display with uh, the words like unbuttonable versus we have we uh, jumble up the, sen the the word and make it a, a word like button unable. This, this kind of uh, thing can be used as a display and the question can be is this a correct word. Now, here it is individually you will you will be mentally basically dividing them. So, button comes here and then unable or un especially unable all of these. So, this probably will take slightly more time than this, this is a simply a word. This is not a possible word in English, but the entire word is not however, the component words are. So, there are these kinds of various kinds of complexities that one can build into the design. So, based but fundamentally this is the idea, there will be something on the screen, the our task will be to understand and then uh, react. So, depending on the research question, you will have a different design. 
right. So, here I was let us say we can think of if we create a different word using the same component words will that help or will that hinder. So, in this case this is not a possible word in English, but this is what is hindering uh, hypothetically let us say this person will take longer time here because individual words within this construction are possible words and they are correct words like this. So, different depending on the research question we can use different kinds of stimulus, but stimulus it is they all will be coming under uh, category of stimulus. Now, lexical decision task we have talked a lot about it mm, uh, basically a string of letters because you cannot call them words since, since we have non words also and then they have to mm, uh, decide whether it is a word in the real world or not and in the in the in the either in one language or in two languages or there can be many variables put in. So, what is measured is the reaction time and also the accuracy. So, the two outputs will be here one is the time of course, that is something that we are talking about, but at the same time we also uh, note the accuracy how many correct answers are there, how many errors are there and then the errors are also analyzed like depending on uh, the relationship between the errors and the kind of words and so on. So, uh, this is uh, accuracy is also another output. Now, a relation this is also uh, the reaction time studies in terms of LDT or lexical decision task. We often refer to them in short like LDT. Uh, so, they take us to the question of mental lexicon as to uh, how do we access the mental lexicon in, in case of bilinguals there are lots of different types of studies using single language uh, um, stimulus versus mixed language stimulus versus alternate language stimulus and trying to see how mental lexicon is accessed and what are the connections between the two languages lexicon of the two languages. So, uh, while real words are there in the mental entry non words do not, but non words also create a lot of trouble. So, these are the kinds of uh, non words. So, there this is one word and this is uh, there is this uh, against this also the way the non words are created typically everything else will remain same except one phoneme. So, in this case everything is same except the last phoneme. So, in this case it is G I R L here it is G I R K this is how non words are created. Non words are maximally similar to existing word with the minute difference of one phoneme either in the initial position or in the uh, final position and so on. So, this is how non words are created non words are created ok. And then uh, we can check various uh, parameters within this task. So, uh, one could be for the frequency frequency is a very important um, variable in terms of lexical decision task or various other kinds of task as well. Frequency means how uh, commonly do you find that word in day to day communication. So, there are some words which are always used some words which are very rarely used some words which are used only in certain domains and so on. So, table chair cup and you know, sky mountain tree these are all high frequency words there are they are used all the time. Um, everybody from children to old age people everybody knows them. However, on the other hand you have some some word like response latency that is what we are using in this uh, course response latency is a word that is not only a low frequency word, but it is also dependent on a particular domain. So, we ha hence as a result frequency is a very important variable. Uh, similarly, you can have uh, words that are learned early versus words that are learned late and then we can combine all of it into this design into this lexical decision design and we can check whether early learned words are remembered or understood quick more quickly compared to late learned words and so on. Another important uh, type of design is what we call priming paradigm. Now, priming is there are two words there are two stimuli that appears on the screen one comes first followed by the other the one that comes first is called the prime the one that comes later on which the subject has to react is called the target. So, the difference between uh, the, there is a prime and there is a target ok. So, uh, if the, there is a relationship between the prime and the target then there is depending on the kinds of relation that we have there can be various kinds of reaction time this is the pair prime and target pair ok. So, there, there is one display and then there is uh, let us say a bit of a gap and then there is a target. So, this is the prime there is a gap here of 500 millisecond and there is a target word here. 
the task is to understand this target word right is this a word or is this uh, you know uh, is this a simple it can, it can be a lex, uh, LDT lexical decision task. So, we can have now depending on the relationship between the prime and target we can have different kinds of results in this simple task. So, the, the why do we reuse prime the, the fundamental logic here is that to see what kind of uh, word level connections make uh, is make it either easier or more difficult to process. So, what are the kinds of parameters for example, the prime and target could be could be connected in terms of let us say semantics. So, I give a word like uh, tiger here and then I give a word like leopard here they are connected tiger and leopard are connected in the sense that they are part of the same family of animals. So, they are connected, but if I give tree here and then I give you uh, let us say pasta here there is no connection whatsoever right. So, depending on this difference we can we will have different kinds of reaction time ok. So, this is just one simple example of how prime is used. So, the connection between prime and um, the target if there is a relationship of some kind there will be faster recognition if there is no re relationship there will be, it will not help. So, the relationship can be semantic it can be phonological it can be orthographic and so on and so forth. Similarly, we also do uh, there are lots of studies on masked versus unmasked uh, paradigm. I have added a lot of reference um, because we cannot really discuss all of this. So, masked and unmasked paradigm is often incorporated with the uh, with the priming paradigms ok. So, and just uh, before we go to mask ma unmasked so for example, bread followed by butter is processed faster. So, if you have bread in the prime and butter in target butter will be processed much faster as opposed to when it uh, if, if the prime was different or let us say bread is prime and butter is uh, target and then bread prime remains and we have cycle as a target there will be no facilitation. So, this will not help processing this however, this will help processing this because the moment we say bread we are already activating the related concepts. So, the uh, in all probability bread is eaten not with sabji, but with butter. So, bread automatically activates the concept associated semantic concept of butter. So, that is why we see a facilitation. However, bread has nothing to do with a cycle typically. Uh, so, this will not help. So, this is how it is. So, so now let us uh, talk about masking condition what do we mean by mask. Uh, so, masking conditions are typically uh, combined with priming paradigm there are two kinds of mask forward and backward depending on where it, it comes before the prime or after the prime ok. Now, the idea of masking is to see uh, to, to minimize the impact of the prime on the target. So, there is uh, let us say there is a prime like homework here uh, this is taken from a recent paper uh, 2022. So, the prime is homework and then you have this mask mask is uh, can, there can be anything there, there are hash marks or sometimes there are lots of cross on the screen. The idea is to make us forget what was before that. So, homework followed by mask and then there is the target word is procrastinate and then this is the target and then you have this uh, uh, this 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 uh, this uh, target stays on the screen as long as uh, that is typically a time given sometimes it is 2000 millisecond or uh, till the participant responds and then there is a gap and then the next uh, thing starts. So, this is basically what uh, masking is all about. So, so, in certain cases the previous uh, one here there is no mask see this is this this is uh, blank. So, there is prime then there is a bit of blank and then uh, this blank can be actually it you can uh, make various changes here also that could be yet another variable. So, how quickly what is the gap between the prime and the target could be a deciding factor in the reaction time. However, we did not use any mask here, but in this case there is a mask. So, we are trying to see how much the mask actually helps to minimize the impact of the prime ok. There is more to it there are some relevant papers in the reference you can always refer to them. Then there is another kind of recognition there is another kind of comprehension uh, task which is called TE. TE stands for translation equivalent recognition. Translation equivalent is nothing but whether the second word is a translation of the first word right. So, there will be uh, the two words will follow in quick succession. So, translated so road followed by and this will go like this 
and we will have a word like uh, rasta let's say so in case of uh, hindi english bilingual so is this uh, the question will be is this a translation of the previous word so if that is the question we need to give them options for both yes and no so we will have road and then we will have something like this so these are the two questions that the subject see but for us for the experimenter this is not what is what we are looking at we probably will look at how there are the various kinds of other variables are affecting this understanding so but in the in a in a basic level this is what it is so road and rasta is rasta a translation of road versus is ghar a translation of road again as i said there are many variables that can be built into this but the task is like this so you can have variables like word frequency translation direction so from in this case let's say this is l2 to l1 direction you can change the directions and make it uh, let's say rasta and then it becomes a road now you can easily check the difference between uh, this direction and this direction you can have a uh, that that itself could be a study so from l1 to l2 direction versus l2 to l1 direction is there an, any difference in comprehension that could be one study this is how, how this is how variables are built into the primary design now there is uh, another kind which is called semantic categorization task semantic categorization tasks have been used um, quite productively across various uh, kinds of uh, domains within the language processing basically what semantic processing uh, semantic categorization task uh, is all about i guess i had mentioned this before in uh, one of the previous uh, modules semantic categorization task is something like this let's say you have word like a simplistic uh, type of semantic categorization task would be like this okay so we have something like a word like animal and then there is a break uh, it's always like this okay so the designs in the experimental uh, outputs are always like this so this is called this is a box design so this is the first display then there is a gap you can have a gap you may not have a gap but uh, let's just uh, keep a gap here and then we say uh, this is so is cat a part of the category animal is is cat an animal this is a very simple semantic categorization task again similarly you can have so this is one option similarly you can also have another option like let's say bus so is bus a kind of an animal is it part of the category this is a semantic categorization task at the root of it this is how what it is now we can have many variables in case of a, since it is a bilingual uh, processing task you can have various variables so you can make it the the first input could be l1 or l2 second also could be l1 or l2 like you can change the these two and then you can again uh, you can also have frequency what frequency you can have various other kinds of parameters built into this but semantic categorization task is simply this the category name and the member name is this a member of the cat that category or is it not again an yes no question um, this, uh, this is also a, a key press and this is the reaction so depending on when is it, when the cat is presented and then till you answer is your reaction time all right you have to answer only in yes or no and that is the time now let us go on to production studies in production studies typically the tasks that are used are uh, picture naming and digit naming picture naming is widely used across different kinds of research questions and different kinds of um, uh, probes whether it is monolingual or bilingual studies and so on typically what will happen in picture naming is there will be a picture um, that will appear on the screen and the subject has to say these are all production studies so we have there has to be a verbal output the person has to name it so that is why picture naming uh, one important thing to remember here is that these pictures are not like real life uh, photographs they are line drawings we will see shortly and then there is digit naming also digit naming has been used in many kinds of um, why picture and digit naming in certain cases picture for example pictures take us to the conceptual level directly without any interference of the language so whether i am a speaker of swahili or a zulu speaker versus a maori speaker or a hindi speaker the picture of a house 
is irrespective of those language linguistic properties. It takes us directly. So, the picture is the direct replica of the concept house, right? So, it is not dependent on the language. So, this is why picture naming has been utilized widely across different kinds of um, uh, paradigms within this domain. So, uh, similarly, digit naming. In at syntactic level, of course, we have uh, syntactic priming and recall tasks. So, this is an example of um, a picture naming task in case of a picture naming what kind of pictures do we use. So, this stands for word frequency. So, this is how you can see how the design this is again from a recent paper. So, there are the differences are how the differences are inbuilt into the design. Only one picture appears on the screen at a time by the way here we are just showing you all the, the various kinds of the variables that they have taken into account. So, one is high frequency word another is low frequency word. So, these are all high frequency tree, fish, hand, dress and so on. These are high frequency and in within both high frequency and low frequency they have differences of low uh, two, two syllable word versus one syllable word. So, we see the number of variables that can be built into a design is uh, quite large depending on the research question. So, this is basically how picture naming task uh, unfolds. So, there is a picture any individual picture like this and the participant has to answer. Now, this answering can happen in one language or in, uh, uh, you know it can be in language 1 versus language 2 and then we can check how the, the, the reaction time changes depending on the language input. And within each language high frequency versus low frequency. Also you can check uh, in case of bilinguals you can check whether early bilingual versus late bilingual difference is a factor in picture naming so on and so forth various kinds of uh, independent variables can be built into this. But the basic design is like this there will be a picture like this and they have to uh, name the picture. Similarly, digit naming looks like this somewhat again a recent work uh, quite a recent work. So, there is this this is what we call fixation uh, cross in the middle then there is a digit and then there is the naming what is it like 4 like that. Similarly, there are some manipulations of these simple designs as well. One is uh, what is called picture word interference paradigm. This is a basically a manipulation of picture naming task, but the uh, with the with the incorporation of a different thing there. So, subjects name, need to name a picture while sometimes hearing a word or sometimes seeing a word written on a picture. So, there is a picture of a cow let us say and then on that picture the word bird is written right. So, you have to uh, depending on what kind of task it is that we have to basically name the cow. So, we have to say cow even though the word bird is interfering with your picture naming. This is what is a picture word interference paradigm to see how different kinds of input stimulus interact with each other ok. And similarly, you can also hear a word while looking at a picture. So, how does the auditory input impact your visual in, uh, visual processing in this particular case. So, this is a visual and auditory um, interference and this is both are visual however, in two different modalities. Because when there is a word written our first uh, in, is almost instinctive that we read the word right. So, hence that kind of a design is created because that will be an automatic processing and this will uh, try to interfere with the uh, targeted uh, the goal at that time which is naming the picture. And this has been utilized uh, again in many different uh, kinds of uh, scenarios. Now, the tools since we have been talking about various kinds of designs that are utilized uh, various kinds of experimental uh, scenarios. Now, how do it we, we constantly keep saying that it is um, presented on the screen how is it presented. So, we need the help of various uh, softwares that are available to them. Uh, this there are software there are many I have just named a few the most uh, commonly utilized ones There is uh, a software called E prime then there is DMDX then there is presentation uh, they have all different sources some of them are free some of them are not one has to purchase. But uh, the primary uh, job of these softwares is that once you have installed them in your system they will and you have to give the stimulus and everything in uh, you have to uh, design the experiment on this and when the experiment is taken to the subjects it takes care of the uh, on the presentation how to present the stimulus and how to uh, log the data and give us an output. So, these are the tools that we typically use DMDX is free A prime is not presentation is also not each of them they are different slightly different from each other depending on various parameters, but these are the most common software that are used. 
Now let us move on to the actual uh, studies that have taken place. Now that the basic uh, information is in place, uh, we go ahead with the, the actual research. Now uh, before we get into what how the research stands as of today, what is the, what are the primary findings and where is the research going ahead, we will go a bit uh, back in history uh, when it all started. So, 1950s to 70s saw a lot of work um, happening in the domain of biling uh, bilingual language processing. Uh, processing literature takes us back to that time. So, during this uh, uh, from 50s to 70s, the focus of the study were these, these are the focus at that time. So, primarily they started with classifying bilingualism, how different kinds of bilinguals are there, what kind of different mechanisms could be involved in each of these and so on. A bit of it we have already discussed and then degree of bilingualism and language dominance which language is dominant, what are the factors that uh, decide and how do we know which language is dominant, these were another another set of questions. Similarly, there was also lexical organization uh, taking us back to the memory measures, uh, to the uh, bilingual memory and then of course bilingual processing. So, these are the primary areas of research interest that have been uh, noted in uh, during this time 1950s to 1970s. So, each of them we will now look at uh, slowly. So, classifying bilingualism basically means that all bilinguals are not same. Remember our in initial lectures that we have bilinguals have these different categories subordinate, coordinate, you know all of that uh, different types. So, this started at that time most notably with Uriel uh, Van Dyke. He was the first to identify that bilinguals can be classified into different types depending on the, uh, the way the, the information is um, stored. So, he, he had a three way division which all of us still use compound coordinate and subordinate bilinguals, but he was not the only person who talked about it. We have also Osgood it is in the same time, but uh, Osgood made a two way distinction as opposed to a three way distinction by Weinreich. Now, among these various researchers uh, Weinreich's ideas were basically uh, hinged upon both lexical and conceptual level, uh, which is not the case with Osgood. So, he made a distinction between lexical and conceptual representation and from there it takes off. Uh, we talked about this in the uh, bilingual memory um, memory uh, section that this is how the, the whole study started as in how are the lexical information uh, uh, represented in the brain and how are the conceptual information represented in the brain and how do they interact. So, starting with Weinreich and then later on we had uh, Groth's um, uh, a revised hierarchical model that takes care of both the lexical representation and the conceptual representation and also the model shows how the relationship can change as a factor of proficiency. So, as the L2 proficiency goes higher, we build a stronger connection between L2 lexical uh, representation and the conceptual representation. So, this uh, so Weinreich studies have remained relevant for quite a long time even today we uh, do um, take them into account. Second was the domain of language dominance, which language is dominant? Is L1, are the people uh, bilinguals L1 dominant or L2 dominant? The primary idea has been that L1 is the dominant language because that is the first language that you learn and that is where you have a higher vocabulary. So, the beginning of the study goes back to Johnson in 1953. He uh, assessed speakers degree of bilingualism by comparing the number of words they could produce. Okay. So, as in the task will be okay. say within this time let us uh, you produce as many words in one language or two language in this language or that language as you can. Depending on the number of words that you could produce, he will give uh, an assessment about the um, degree of bilingualism. So, they will say somebody can produce uh, 50 words in uh, the L1, but only 30 in L2. So, then that there is a difference that could be assessed. So, this is one of the first uh, types. Lambert uh, was among the first to use reaction time for this study. So, you had there is a task and then depending on how long you take. So, reaction time was uh, reaction time started to get used even at that time 1955. So, his study showed that bilinguals reacted faster to direction given in their dominant language and this difference uh, between the languages decreased as L2 proficiency increased. So, the task was to give, uh, you know, they, there was directions given. So, uh, right, uh, left, 
you know, like this. So, there are the directions that are given and how quickly you respond to it that there was a difference that he found uh, L1 was re reacted to faster as opposed to L2. However, as L2 proficiency went higher, the people reacted, the participants reacted quickly as well. So, this was one of the first reaction time studies that Lambert uh, did and on the basis of these studies, they, they uh, went on to actually create a set of tests, then, then uh, developed a set of tests including of course uh, RT and uh, to check this uh, idea of dominance and uh, uh, how what kind of degree of bilingualism that existed. So, these are some of the tests that are still used um, word completion test, word detection test and so on and very often RT was used as a dependent variable. Now, as a result of all of these remember this we are talking about 1950s. So, as a result of these they declared that bilingualism is reflected in many aspect of linguistic behavior that through processing through uh, giving them tasks through experimental uh, paradigm we can check what are the different kinds of behavior that are impacted due to bilingualism is what the single most contribution of his uh, of Lambert is. So, that he not only he created with different kinds of sets of tasks, but also um, uh, administered them and this is the in, in, these are the initial findings of bilingualism uh, processing research within bilingualism. Now, these were followed by uh, Irwin and Magister in 1961 and 79. Um, Irwin used picture naming latencies, latency is a time uh, in two languages to determine language dominance. So, pictures as I said if various uh, different kinds of independent variable can be built into. So, Irwin built in the two languages, there are pictures, same pictures you name in L1 and you name them in L2. The time difference is what he took as a measure of language dominance. So, L1 if naturally will take less time in L1, so L1 is dominant. Magiste used uh, different kinds of tasks, uh, he used both encoding and decoding tasks. So, encoding picture naming and digit naming are called encoding tasks and decoding is following direction and reading words aloud. So, there are different kinds of tasks that they used and they found the for understanding language uh, dominance, which language is dominant depending on the reaction time. Okay. Then uh, we move on to bilingual lexical uh, organization. This is something that we have talked about. Uh, so, initial psychological studies uh, within bilingualism in the 50s had a very close association with the research in human memory system within psychology. This was not happening in language, this was happening in psychology. There was a lot of work going on trying to understand how human memory really works, what are the different, what are the uh, functional parameters. So, so, that is where this connection also was built in because language was used uh, very often in these studies to understand human memory words were used. So, that is why the connection became very strong. So, studies using language uh, because they were often part of the larger uh, studies as a result of which this is also uh, uh, where bilingual lexical organization started, the studies uh, in this domain started. And this is at the same time also, this is where we were talking about shared and uh, separate memory hypothesis. So, um, Kohler's again a very important name in this uh, domain in the 60s, he used word association and free recall study um, that, uh, and they, he tried to show that through this, this various kinds of studies he showed that probably separate memory hypothesis is tenable. So, free recall task of course, we have already seen what it is. So, what he did was list of words were given in single language versus mixed language. So, the one, la one list sometimes the list was only one language, sometimes the list consisted words from both L1 and L2 and then participants were asked to recall as many words as they could. Now, the, the difference between the performance between a uh, single language versus mixed language group was taken as a measure to understand how much uh, the organization, what is the organization. So, if the mixed language, if be a, a mixed language does not give you a different result from single language group means there is a shared memory. If there are differences it will mean separate memory. Similarly, word association task also had words in one language and their translation in another language. These were used as stimulus. Now, the participants were then asked to provide the first word that comes to their mind. So, let us say they had they use uh, this kind of a thing. So, house and ghar, Hindi and English and the participant tells us only uh, road or sometimes they will use let us say rasta that could be one possibility. Another possibility is they can give us road and khirki. So, depending on what kind of word we get 
we have we are talking about different kinds of representation. So, if we are if we get let us say after hearing ghar we hear khirki that means the, this is intralingual processing that is happening within the same language that is happening. However, if you get house and ghar and after that you get road and rasta this is an interlingual translation response. If this is uh, the case then if this if there are higher number of such cases then this is taken as an evidence for shared hypothesis because you can go across languages and because it is free you could uh, answer either in, in, in Hindi or in English or as the actual study was had taken Chinese and English participants so they were free to use the Chinese or English. But depending on the choice that you do and which uh, kind of response are higher that will take us to either shared or separate memory hypothesis. So, he found a low percentage of um, uh, such responses and hence he endorsed separate memory hypothesis. Now, since both of these methods dependent or uh, depended on using individual words as stimulus, research on memory organization became almost uh, synonymous with lexical um, organization. So, human memory organization on lexical organization became very closely tied together because of the stimulus that was given. Now, gradually the difference that was brought in separation between lexical and conceptual uh, representation and uh, studies started taking into uh, account this factor again by Kohler's himself. However, this study picked up pace only in the 70s and there are some of these references that one can look up for the beginning of those studies. Similarly, there is a bilingual um, uh, exploring bilingual language processing. So, these are the four domains that were uh, uh, quite popular during 1950s to 70s. The reason why we have taken such a broad domain, broad time uh, frame is because a lot of things happen within that time. However, it is not as the floodgate had not really opened as it did after in the 90s. So, at that time there was slow but steady progress, there were lots of new findings. Those findings were getting um, solidified by more um, uh, different kinds of studies and so on. So, in many sense this was the beginning, this was the first few decades of bilingual language processing taking into account different aspects within that larger umbrella term and trying to figure out each of them separately. So, that is why this broad time frame. So, within lexical processing domain studies on language switching and interference was also a very uh, important domain to study. Uh, switching and as you can imagine the say switching and interference again takes us uh, to it connects to the shared versus separate memory hypothesis. So, the studies in this um, there were two different types concept of language switch and the separate and shared memory hypothesis. The idea of language switch is very interesting one which we still study even today we study. So, the idea was that if bilinguals took more time to read 100 words from a mixed list as compared to a single language list it was due to the time it took to switch one language off. So, basically the idea was if it is a mixed language list then reading them will make you go back and forth between language 1 and language 2. So, when you are speaking in language 1 you have to switch off in some sense L2 or when you are speak uh, when you are uh, uh, using L2 you have to switch off the L1. So, basically there has to be an on off switch sort of a thing and that is why it takes longer time. Mixed language reading takes longer time and the reason was uh, that was given was this. So, this could also mean that the two languages are represented separately. So, if there are two uh, language, two lexical representations, so one when you are accessing one you are shutting off the other and that means obviously that there are two different storages. So, language switch the idea of language switch was closely connected to separate memory hypothesis. So, the first study to report uh, switch cost was as I said Kohler 66. They had three different tasks one was read passages for comprehension, read passages aloud, read and then orally summarize the passages. So, three different kinds of task and then the first two tasks had three different kinds of conditions. So, a reading passage for comprehension in single language, in alternating language and then in mixed language. Alternating language is a very interesting uh, paradigm to use. So, different uh, one sentence in one language, second sentence in L2, third in L1, fourth in L2 like this alternating the language in each sentence uh, that is one option. Another was single language the entire passage in one language and then mixed. The mixing happened both within the sentence and across sentences. 
The third task which was reading and summarizing, they had to summarize in either one language, alternating or mixed language. So, these were the tasks. So, these were these two were comprehending and this was a production study, right. So, this he did a, a complete set of studies here. The result found that the first task did not show any impact of mixed language condition. However, the second and the third task did show some effect of mixed language condition. So, to him this provided evidence for language switch because mixed language is taking more time hence the idea of switch was tenable. So, a lot of studies followed and there are some examples here and language switching in fact has remained a very important uh, domain of research within bilingual uh, language processing and today we, we know a lot more about the processes involved which we will see later, but this is how it all began. Another way of looking at the same question was cross language interference. In such studies, the focus is to find out if performance in language A would affect performance in language B. If there is a connection between these two, then there is of course that means there is an interference and if there is an interference that will mean that there is some amount of shared memory between these two languages. Again a very important study 1959 suggested that this will not happen since the other language is switched off. So, if the switching and uh, the idea of language switch is tenable that means one language is, is possible to switch off your L1 while you are using L2 or the other way around if that is the case then there will be no interference right. However, if interference is proved that means switching is not tenable. So, that was the idea and uh, so what this um, they do is the studies in this domain usually use both within language and between language task which we have already seen in various kinds various studies that have used this and we already um, have seen the results. So, various uh, both shared and separate memory hypothesis were actually found to be tenable and that is how we came to know that there are two uh, layers and two, two levels of representation in the brain lexical and conceptual and hence there are the and that is how the hierarchical models came into being. Then uh, 1980s we will talk about only this decade and then 90s also uh, as, a, as one decade at a time. So, the beginning of this decade more hierarchical models became um, popular as we have just said that uh, depending on the findings from the previous decade new models came into existence the, um, starting with uh, lexical uh, various kinds of hierarchical models. There was a very notable uh, symposium that took place in 1981 in uh, New York. So, they were trying to focus on how the different kinds of surface form like picture, word, L1, L2 difference and so on are connected to the underlying conceptual system. Just as we were mentioning are they tenable, are they accessing the separate kinds of representation or are they accessing same, same representation at the conceptual level and so on. And these studies were uh, published in uh, 1984 issue of verbal lang uh, learning and verbal behavior and these two studies as we have seen before are the landmark studies by uh, one is Potter et al in 1984 and Scarborough et al 1984. So, this, this is how this basically opened um, a Pandora's box in this in this domain uh, of understanding shared versus separate memory hypothesis. Another change uh, that happened during this time was in terms of methodology. Now, prior to this time response type and latency uh, and accuracy were the main measures. However, the response time was limited in terms of only language dominance and degree of bilingualism as we have seen before because it was not very widely used across uh, different kinds of research uh, questions or designs. So, only few cases this was used as I can see the references. So, more important was word association and free recall studies at that time during before before 1980s. However, 1980s something uh, changed which is computers became largely available. It became uh, quite common to use computers for uh, experimental work and as a result reaction time studies became more feasible uh, which is understandable because today we have different kinds of uh, softwares available. So, we can actually create very different kinds of quite nuanced and complex designs. Similarly, the major change that happened in 80s was the use of computers. Uh, or let us say widespread use of computers and hence reaction time studies became uh, quite popular. So, in the, in the next segment we will talk about uh, the changes that happened in 1990s and then move on to 
the 2000s and the kind of changes and sophist more sophistication that was built into these studies and where we are today. Mm -hmm.